And we are back. Uh, this is an exciting one. We're, we're heading to outer space today, Maddie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Joined by special guest Sasha Derry um, with Blue Shift. And we're going to learn a lot about uh, biofuel rocket launches. Um, I was telling Sasha backstage here, uh, mm -hmm. if I didn't know an answer in 10th grade biology, I would refer to, you know, I'd just plug in photosynthesis and, and hopefully uh, <laughs> score above a 70. How often did that work for you? Did you, like, do you have any data on that? I, bailed, I, I don't know. I do remember one specific quiz where I got it right. I was, like, <laughs> I was elated with my 75. It was like I, positively I, reinforced from there. Yeah, there. yeah. Yes. I suppose it's no different from when you used to take tests on those Scantron sheets and you just made patterns and everybody convinced themselves like the answer is mostly D, which actually... This is a good study. Whenever there's a question of all of the above, I wonder what percentage of time that's the answer compared to the three answers above. Because I feel like it's almost always, but we are now well on a tangent. Um, yeah, Gibby, we're back. We, uh, we can test that. Yeah, we might have to test that out. Yeah, I've always been curious and I've never done the study because nobody should do that I, study. I think there are SAT, yeah, we're way off on the rails here, but yeah. I, uh, I think there are SAT uh, prep coaches that are, you know- okay thousands of dollars well you're back in the you're gonna be back in the game we'll get you connect, connect me with some of those folks and we'll get to the bottom of it so sasha um i can I, i'm not gonna get this correct i was reading your bio um and you can fill me in a little bit on things i get right or wrong or you can just tell the story a little bit um but you're the ceo for blue shift and aerospace company you've been doing rocket launches studying uh, biofuel for commercial side. We're not sending people into outer space yet, but so tell me a little bit, what got you started, you know, a little bit of your story, Sasha. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, the, the, the sort of the backstory behind aerospace or the love of space is actually goes back many more years. So I, I grew up in, here in Maine and, uh, you know, with Maine, growing up in Maine, especially in rural Maine, you get a really good view of the universe at night. Yeah. And so I think combination of that, um, you know, there was a period in my life where I also, I grew up in the, you know, almost the literal sticks of Maine, we grew up in the woods in a cabin for a couple of years cool. and sort of developed a, you know, appreciation for nature. And so I've always, you know, I've kind of always had that like uh, connection between passion for science and space and also sort of appreciation for our planet. And, you know, when I eventually, you know, I, gra I graduated from two technical degrees and one in physics and another one in electrical engineering, I was always trying to find ways to kind of combine benefiting, um, benefiting humanity with like doing something really cool and interesting in technology. So, yeah. but I, you know, I, I grew up just post, um, you know, I was born just post the whole Apollo era. Okay. And uh, yep. so you, I, I'm, I was reading those books that you read about like, oh, here's all the incredible things we're going to do in the 1980s and the 1990s. Yeah. And like, we're going to go to the moon and well beyond Mars and beyond. Right. <laughs> and it's like, no, we're never going back to the moon and we're just going to circle the earth for the rest of our lives. And <laughs> yeah. We're so good with little, this one. Yeah. We're yeah, going to stick yeah, here and learn about it. Here. Do loops. Um, <laughs> so we did donuts around the earth for you know a couple of decades. And um, I personally was, you know, somebody who, uh, you know, really interested in seeing the exploration of our universe. Um, was disappointed. And I know like probably hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people were disappointed. So, um, so, uh, you know, for me, I knew eventually one way or another, I, my, my life would lead me to a way of getting into the space industry. And then, you know, early 2000s, you see SpaceX really, you know, you've got to give them credit for um, demonstrating um, that the space industry is not just the domain of governments. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. they, you know, they, they really were the seeding process that, because they were successful, because there were predecessors to them that tried to do what they did, um, to saying that this can be done, can be done successfully. And I think the government, the U.S. government specifically learned that it, it is okay to let commercial entities enter this realm. And so, um, I, so for me, it was seeing that this can be done, done successfully was, was also, you know, impetus to get into it. And that's, that's actually what what they refer to as the new space industry is where like okay. government says, you know, old world is like uh, governments do everything in space and it's their domain. N the new space industry or new space is when wacky companies like our own get into, uh, co you know, commercializing access to space. So anyways, but long story short, I love this since I was a kid. 
and I love it now. And it is absolutely exhilarating to run a company where every day, you know, you're working towards punching it to space. I mean, yeah. there, and, and I've also gained a strange appreciation for people with loud mufflers. <laughs> you hear them now. <laughs> <laughs> like I've never really got it, but, but like, I finally get why people. It means out power. Their yeah, that noise. And so uh, I, I also gained an appreciation for loud mufflers. In our case, it's a rocket engine that I swear isn't out of the normal loud, but it is, it is fun to listen to. So I know, um, well, I mean, they say you work, do something you love, you don't work a day in your life. And that's, yeah. I think a lot of people envy, not that there wasn't a lot of work that went into getting to this point to be able to do the things that you love. Knowing that you all are like sort of focused on sending up research payloads, satellites, et cetera. Two part question. First is how many other companies are there like yours? So how like how big is this industry now? Because you mentioned it doesn't have to be government, right? So there's probably factions of different types of rocket aerospace type companies. And Greg, our friend, our mutual friend Greg, who introduced us to you, remember a few months back, maybe even multiple months back, where he told us about one of your launches. And my second question is, where are you actually physically launching from? Because I know that there's obviously specific places. So kind of a long one, but a two parter. Yeah, so in terms of um, uh, companies out there, so less, I saw a number, a stat around this, it was like 140, 150 other rocket companies um, trying to enter into the new space industry. Wow. Um, so quite a few. And so when we launched Stardust uh, two years ago, back in 2021, January 31st, 2021, um, it put us into a special class of rocket companies that have actually launched something. Yeah. And this actually came from an investor, a potential investor, and now investor who said, we, you know, we're tired of hearing about rocket companies that are going to do blah, 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 blah. Prove it to you. You can even build the rocket, yeah. get your engine running, get some customers and launch it and recover it successfully. So we did all those things. And he didn't say do it in the dead of winter in Maine when it's minus 14 degrees <laughs> yeah. Fahrenheit, but we did that as well. Uh, bonus points yeah bonus points for that yeah. you should have um i remember also this incident just a side note on that one i remember um uh it was like a month or two after we had launched and of course you know we're just a, it was just a small vehicle it's a prototype that we launched um yeah but i i remember the russians were poking fun at like the u.s and especially uh spacex saying you guys are not you know rugged enough to launch in the cold like we do in the winter and it's like i'm sorry actually there is a company in the United States. <laughs> sir mr yeah. putin uh actually yeah, pardon me uh so um but yeah so we we actually went from a domain of like 140 150 companies who are developing rockets and rocket engines to a domain of 10 12 maybe 15 companies that ever launched anything Cool. And doing okay. it and doing it with payloads. We had two paying customers, and we had one freebie as an academic payload. Mm. So that put us into a whole different class um, of companies. Uh, and so that's when and when we did that, that's actually what set off um, the following days, like three days. I got an email. I think I didn't pass out my email, but somehow approximately 440 people found my email address one way or another because that's how many emails I got. It was like every eight minutes. I would get emails at people ask me, how can I invest in your company? And that's when we decided that we wanted to do an equity crowdfunding campaign. That's really um, cool. So, so, um, so we, the competition is fierce. And the hardest part is the rocket engine development part. Um, so it took us four, yeah. four years to develop the, the fuel, uh, a year and a half and a NASA grant to develop the engine that really combusted the fuel well. But it only took us nine months to build a composite airframe, find customers, um, work with the FAA to get licensing, may build a launch rail system, find a launch site, and then of course, dastardly do it in the middle of winter. And, you know? and, get, and to me, and again, I have no idea how any of this works, but like recovering the rocket feels to me like it would be the most challenging part of this because I know you can control it, but how do, what does that look like? I've always wondered that. I've never actually been able to figure that out. So we're, we're you know, for in that case, it was a very low altitude launch, but we, you know, we just did a basic parachute recovery. So it was, it was pretty easy. Yeah. That said, that's also exactly what we're planning to do for our all the way to space launch, which is the next one upcoming. Cool. Um, so, but the difference being, it's not going to be at a former air force base. 
This could be out at the ocean or uh, it's looking very likely that we're gonna launch from Spaceport America for this very next uh, launch. So, um, so that, that you're, you're just doing tons of analysis to kind of look at what the trajectory could be and yeah. the winds and you have to do a lot of analysis just before you launch and like the FA, these are all things the FA requires. So you don't land on people and property or hurt anything. Yeah. Or at least yeah. you can predict that's like a one out of a million chance that I can land on a person's house. So. Did you have to like make any adjustments based on weather? Because you are doing it in January and May, right? Mm -hmm. There's snow, there's wind, there's, you know, as you said, negative. The temperature of the like, air probably impacts it oh, as well, man, right? You, that was so frustrating. It was, by the way, cold, but it was really, it created a lot of problems for us. Um, okay. The first one, which we, we had a failed, we had a scrub a launch due to weather conditions. So we tried once and then we had to try two weeks later. Okay. That was really, um, that was really uh, agitating to have to wait. You're I'm sure. looking at the weather every You're all ramped half up. Hour. I know. Um, but the, so we learned one of the things we learned quickly was the batteries shut down on on the the rocket, right? And so uh, we had we were put in like a small, basically, hair, you know, air hair, air dryer or air, you know, hot hot air blower, basically. Yeah. Um, to heat up and we had to kind of stick in the rocket and hope that it was heat up enough so when we tried again we'd already created a solution that allowed us to sort of on the ground kind of warm up the pack and it was even colder the the second time around but the thing that we didn't count on was the damn laptop shut down like immediately uh so we'd had the laptops out there and we're ready you know getting all set and um to, to you know getting things all propped up and the batteries like there's these laptops almost have like temperature sensors and they like shut down within like minutes. Oh, so I think we had like the first launch um, of a rocket uh, where the mission control was inside of uh, a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get Guinness out to make sure we get you certified, get a plaque for that. Yeah, right. First Prius <laughs> mission control. <laughs> it's funny though, right? There's so many things that can go wrong and you can't even really predict all of them. Like, do you go into it thinking like, okay, we can control these things. This stuff in this bucket is sort of out of our control. And there's a third bucket that's like, we don't even know what could happen. And then you just kind of account for it and you stay agile. Yeah. I mean, I give a lot of credibility, a lot of credit to, to our engineers. So, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the guys are much more, uh, much more thoughtful and detailed oriented than I am. They're trying to figure out every different failure rate, failure mode. And, um, and they think it through. Now, what I think makes it makes our folks different, and you know, maybe not so different in the rocket world, is I, I think since so many of them have grown up in Maine, you 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 know everybody's basically uh, everybody knows how to make it make it work with with what are the resources they have at yeah. hand, and yeah. uh, and that was true for our team. Like we when we did have that when we did have that launch, we actually did have a failure. Um, just prior launch. And so turns out the pressure had like failed, but within like an hour and a half, uh, the guys were at the rocket and had fixed it and we were ready to go again. And so <clears throat> I think one of the things is, that's really important is to have folks that are persistent and resilient. And that yep. resiliency comes in many, many, many forms. Like not only like resiliency in the face of, the face of stress and the face of like unknown unknowns, but also in the face of daggone cold weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, I'm useless in the cold. That's why yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I, I used to be better. And nowadays I'm sort of like, I just don't, I can't function. I am like in my own head about it. So, and also like technology isn't going to work either. Did you guys end up, is there like, did you build like housing units for the electronics so that they would be able to withstand the elements? Or did you just get them where they needed to be and you get them up into the atmosphere and you're okay? So we, we basically, um, we uh, basically put heater pads inside the rocket that we okay. were able to heat up just prior to launch. Gotcha. The launch itself was very quick. So, yeah. And it wasn't all the way to space by any means. It was just up, um, just, it was just over a mile. Actually, it was, it was just a mile. And that's 50, that, yeah, 5,200. Yeah, we were restricted. Um, we were restri restricted to that altitude because of the FAA uh, and where we could possibly come down. Um, so, gotcha. Um, so we, we had to turn off the engine. So, but we had a lot of, um, it was, you know, there was a lot of stressors just for that launch right next to our launch site was a federal reserve, um, oh. who, who we were been told that if we, if a single gum wrapper 
yeah. fell in there, there would be a federal investigation, let alone Ugh, those rocket guys. drifting over there. So we <laughs> we had to be so, so careful. And the team really punched it. I mean, you asked, I, I think it was um, Mike, you had asked about, you know, do you make any last minute modifications? Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, yeah. So but the, the guys had to rotate the entire launch trailer. And this is like a seriously heavy rig um that's been you know staked down at the ends yeah and uh you may one hour prior launch there had to be a slight adjustment due to the prevailing winds um, oh, wow. and we had to make those uh actually it might have been two hours ahead of time but uh ultimately we pegged it we like we landed there were so much so many trees around so many places so many ways it could have gone wrong and somehow we went up and then pegged it in terms of the landing and landed probably just I don't know, 500 feet away from where we launched from, which in oh, this wow. case is a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Not bad at all. So you mentioned a couple of times, Sasha, around like, you know, Prius sustainability and, and resources. And, you know, I, as I was reading through and doing some of my research, um, you know, I found that this is something that is, um, it's, it's growing, it's a growing trend. Mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing more potential launches, more companies out there. And something that I, I saw that that you're doing is looking for sustainable um, aerospace yeah. launches. Um, so you don't need to go into details. We don't need to know how the sausage is made or anything or how the <laughs> rocket is built. But don't you know um, it's made from sausage. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious, you know, um, where did that stem from? That idea stem from, and you know, how have you been able to implement it, and and you know what the the impact of that is? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I don't think I mentioned it, but you know, I think you guys know we were the first company in not only in the United States, but the world to have launched a rocket commercially uh, using a, a, a bio-derived fuel. Yep. And in our case, it was not only bio-derived, but carbon neutral fuel and non-toxic, uh, awesome. which is pretty daggone uncommon. Yeah. So, um, and I, I should also just brag for a moment that when us, just this little dinky rocket company did this, um, we had the BBC covering us and a couple other outlets kind of catch caught the news and about us being the first bio, you know, biofuel powered rocket engine. Um, and it seemed to change the dialogue in the space industry. Well, they yeah. were suddenly questioning the big guys, wait a minute, why are you guys using if this exists? Yeah. 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 Why can't the billionaires, you know, make the switch? Yeah. And that was that was actually really neat to see that we were having in our own way a little a little effect. Okay. Um, but you know w the origination of this was you know I think I don't know might have been like two thousand and nine. I just started like devoting all my free time. This is for kids. Um, yeah. <laughs> devoting all my time to like uh, reading every textbook and uh, everything I could download from the internet about every paper I could about propulsion technology, rockets, because we had this, I, I, I had a vision of what I wanted to do someday, long, long time in the future. Stretch, yeah. Now. It's a very, very stretch goal. And um, so I just started learning everything I could. And that's when we kind of started, fo I started focusing on um, a certain type of rocket engines called hybrid rocket engines. They're not quite as efficient, as powerful as, um, you know, type of things, you see, the liquid rocket engines you see, you see like yeah. SpaceX using. Yeah, but they're more efficient and powerful than like the the boosters that were on the side of the of the of the shuttle. Give and take. Yeah, the the solid uh, fuel rockets. And um, so I knew I wanted to use that technology one way or another. And what I so I started doing an engine test and um, on my brother's farm in Maine, and uh, and using this petroleum version of the fuel. And the really cool thing about this this rocket engine is it's much safer. It's you don't have to worry about toxic materials. It's just easier to deal with and, and just, just, just far safer. You don't have to, you know, lose limbs, yeah. um, which is awful handy. Yeah. So I was, I, we had just, I'd done, just finished up some tests with an engineering buddy of mine. And we, I went into my brother's house, sat down, um, probably had a beer and looked out, looked out his window. And there in his windowsill was something he had just pulled off the, uh, off the farm uh, just a few weeks prior. And I said, man, that might work as a fuel source. And if, and, you know, if I could use it, it would be such more, such more, so much more sustainable yeah. than using petroleum version. So long story short is 
we spun up a version of that, our fuel with that sustainable fuel. And I was okay with it being not working as well as petroleum. And we found out it worked better than the petroleum fuel that we were using um, pretty quickly, which was amazing, which was amazing. And I would imagine too, you know, if you've ded dedicated and devoted this amount of time to it, it sounds like to back to your previous statement, it sounds like it's scalable enough where at some point in time, you know, this, this serves the first part of your mission that you told yeah. us about when we started talking, you know, you want to build some really cool stuff, but you want to do good for humanity. Yeah. What do you see as the potential for these larger companies that are doing this to maybe gravitate to, is there enough incentive for them to do it? Do you think it's scalable? Like, where do you fall on that in terms of like using it up market? Yeah, so I mean, you certainly can scale this technology up. And one of the nice things about it is the technology itself is actually far less uh, costly versus, versus the traditional rocket engines. That's good. So like the, the plumbing that's required for our engines is roughly half compared oh. to traditional right. rocket engines. Okay. And so that saves complexity when you build it and, and manufacture it over and over. Um, and, uh, you know, our fuel actually happens to be less expensive than rocket fuel per kilogram. It's actually more energy dense than traditional rocket, rocket fuel. Um, but you, you, so you could scale it up and, and um, there's no reason you couldn't, you couldn't do that. It, for a given amount of stuff you want to take to space, you would need more rocket. Yeah. But the size of the rocket doesn't necessarily mean how expensive it, it can be. Yeah. But what, what drives the expense is sort of the, the plumbing aspect the plumbing. and all the things you have to do inside there. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of the bigger drivers. Yeah. Okay. So you certainly could scale it up. However, I'd argue if, if you're not trying to get people into space mm -hmm. and large, 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 you know, satellites into space, then you don't necessarily need to. And I think the future of space, the space economy, humanity in space, We'll, we'll always evolve a, a little bit of big stuff, sending big rockets up to space. But there's, there's going to be a tipping point in the future where taking resources from Earth is not going to mm. be the most economical way of doing things when you're already in space. Yeah. It's going to be far cheaper to launch something from the moon or from an asteroid or manufacturing the, out in space where you don't have to, you don't have to spend. That's you know, cool. Yeah, like 90, 95% of the rocket is fuel and propellant, right? And it's mm. only like anywhere from two to 5% of that is your actual thing you want to put in space. Yeah. And if our, if our planet was any bigger than it is, it would, we, we probably wouldn't see a space industry because we wouldn't be able to get off the planet without like nuclear, you know, nuclear powered rockets or something. That's just, interesting. So we're, we're that close to being too big, of a, too big of a planet to get off of the planet. So... So meanwhile, like, you know, the, 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 there's a whole big movement in the industry from launching big bus size satellites to putting them far out in uh, orbit to making these tiny satellites that are, you know, orders of magnitude less expensive and putting them in a much closer Earth orbit. And these, you know, literally things that you and I could hold in our hands, uh, the size of like bread boxes. And with that big movement, you're going to, I think what you're seeing is yeah, there's going to be a lot of big rocket companies initially deploying perhaps constellations of, of, these, of these tiny satellites, along with some of the big ones. But, you know, the market is showing that in a couple of years, that's going to flatline. And the reason it's going to flatline is that those orbits are basically going to get filled up. Yeah. And um, what's going to be needed is no longer large, you know, basically rocket construction vehicles deploying these satellites. Now you need the small maintenance vehicles that can replace individual tiny satellites. And that's what we're going to do. That's where the big market is. That's cool. Is. It's not deploying the initial highway. Let other companies do that. Yeah. We're going to be the pothole fillers. So. Yeah. That's smart, though. That's Glorious smart. It, pothole it all, fillers. Yeah, but it gives you plenty. Go about potholes. All yeah. Good. It gives you runway to yeah. get this right to be a part of that ecosystem. And you're right. Like, I think the normal individual who just sort of like casually explores this topic there's a whole lot of unknown, right? Like it's infinite space. We don't know. And I don't have any clue how those things work, but you do understand the concept of satellites, space stations, objects floating the earth that we can use. And so I think that's really smart. That's awesome. I didn't realize that. Yeah. You, there, there'll be a place for you then. There'll definitely be a place. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think, I think too, a lot of, um, I think we're going to see more and more things being sent up to space that are small in nature. 
and they're robotic and they're going out there and you don't necessarily need giant machines to start doing mining operations or 3D printing operations or manufa basic manufacturing. You can do it slowly and just have robots sort of, you know, little by little work down, a, work down an asteroid, work, work in cislunar. Um, so, I, you know, that there's, there's a lot of opportunities to do things small. It's like, it's like, it's like we're going from the decades of like mainframe computers and punch cards to yeah. like, you know, cell phones. You know? Yeah. Yep. Your modern smartphone. Yep. Um, so there must have been a time, you know, on a personal level too, where, you know, you started this really in earnest, it sounds like back in 2009, where someone told you you were crazy. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm curious, like, you know, conversations that you had, like, was there something that really drove you where you were like, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to make this happen, whether it was one tipping point, or it was, just a, a consistent, I'm spending all my free time on this. I, I know there's a way to make it happen other than that moment out in the, the um, farm. That's a, that's a really good question. You know, there's things that happen in your life and you, you, you start, you know, I was, I was in my um, mid thirties, probably when I was thinking that, you know, it's probably too early to have a midlife crisis then, but, <laughs> um, but I, I was definitely thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, what was important for me. And, um, and you know, with my renewable energy company, which I started in '99, yeah, um, I already had the the sensibilities. I actually had a failed company startup before that one, but I had the sensibilities of like how to start something from the ground and move up um, and do it organically. Um, and so I knew I could do that if I could assemble the right team. You know, I think that the one of the one of the things that as, as I think about it is. Um, one, there was a book that I read, uh, that I read by, uh, Peter Diamandis, um, who, uh, who, I think he started Space University or something like that, but he's, he's been really influential in, um, the space industry, but he, he kind of, if you read this book bold, he kind of talks about how to kind of do things in a way that's really small and doesn't require, um, obnoxious amount of money up front and you basically yeah. but the key is to kind of bring on like-minded individuals and to work uh to work together um and to, to share resources across not only individuals but organizations you have to read the book i'm doing a really poor job okay. <laughs> that's okay <laughs> that's... but but the, the point is i think that was actually that was a little bit of a tipping point between between spacex doing what they did back in the early 2000s you know beginning yeah. you know suffering in the early 2000s like it's all crazy. of us are doing that's now. so long ago yeah i know it's crazy it is really crazy <laughs> uh yeah it feels like yesterday uh -huh. and then um and then reading that book and then actually another one that's been influential for me is uh an organization out in europe called copenhagen out in copenhagen copenhagen suborbitals and seeing this gritty crew of folks building their own rocket and ultimately their their plans are to launch a rocket and send people up to space we're definitely not going to do that we might sound okay. like a lobster, but that's not that. So I think that was sort of <laughs> that was sort of pivotal for me. And this realizing like you have one life. I mean, this is my opinion. Sure. I mean, people, other people might vary, but as far as I know, I have one life. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I've got one shot at this to do what I want to do with my life. And I want to be able to look at like back in my life, like I did the things that really excited me and that really felt like it made a difference in a positive way. And, you know, I, I already had that sort of instinct, but I think, you know, there's the things you, and, and inevitably you, you look your childhood, I'm sure, and that's how space comes up for me. But inevitably you probably look at the elements of your childhood and, and you're like, no, this is what I really want to do with my life or I want to see for others in, in, in this world. And I can actually be part of it as opposed to passively riding the tails of other people. And so, yeah. Um, Crazy is definitely the looks on many faces that I got from many, many, <laughs> many people, starting with my friends and absolutely with my, my family. Um, and, but I've gotten those looks before and I've punched through that. And sometimes do, you know you're on the right, the right path when you, when, you, when you get crazy as a response to what you're doing. By the way, sometimes it is actually crazy, so you should be aware. Yeah, no, yeah, but, but I, it's it's it's, it's <laughs> you know I understand I get that though it's it's unfortunate that we probably as a society stifle more people like you from trying things because it's not the norm. So I, I do appreciate 
we've had entrepreneurs on before and I think about what you just said a lot myself, like you've got one life, make a mark with it, do something meaningful. I think we all probably gravitate in and out of feeling like we are or aren't, but you know, you're, it's really cool because you did pursue it. And the the commonality between yourself, small business owners, entrepreneurs, et cetera, is that stick-to-itiveness that you were mentioning about your engineers earlier, just the determination and the, and the discipline to like stick with it. Yeah. Cause it's just so much easier to quit. So yeah, I agree with that. That makes sense to me. That, that the, the grit part is absolutely key. And I knew that's who I needed in people. Um, and I, I do feel like in the state of Maine, you can find a lot of people like that. Um, I'm completely biased. Um, I am yep. too, Sasha. So, um. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll agree with you guys. Cause you're not like, you're not spoiled. You're not like quote unquote soft, right? Like you have to, it's, it's, it's hardy. You got to figure it out. It is. Yeah. 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 Especially more rural. I mean, a lot of our folks in our team grew up in rural parts of uh, our state. Of course, we live in a pretty non-rural part now, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a couple more questions before we, we uh, I could, my, my mind's in, in outer space right now. To your trend thing. <laughs> I love it up there. So, um, but, but uh, you know, what's, what's next for, um, for you guys? Where, you know, is there something ambitious that if you can share that um, well he mentioned he alluded to it earlier right the next launch is like all the way up into yeah, space into space so what's that mean a little bit about that and like what's cool. going into that how is that different than um stardust yeah so right now we're, we're actually right now we're pivoting to a um a fundraising round it's like a it's a four million dollar seed round that we're um we're raising with you know uh Awesome. Credit investors. So this is our first time venturing into the the big pants world of uh, of uh, VCs and yeah. investors. Um, but I feel like we've we've grown to that point. So, but the the point for this funding is to um, to ultimately build our first suborbital to space launch vehicle. We call it Starless Rogue. Uh, we already have customer payloads booked for this. They're all. Um, uh, student payloads, and it's through a partner of ours called Max IQ Space, which builds these really cool, almost Lego-like, um, uh, like uh, science projects. You just choose from all these different sensors and gear. And you design, you, kids can design their own project, program it up, and they can cool. launch with us, and then like analyze their data. And we've already seen because we've already begun engaging with the, these kids, um, actually from all over the country um uh how how it makes them so excited and passionate about stem about science yeah um and that is exactly the reason why max iq started this uh this company max iq space so um we're really excited to be you know have uh, you know kids from not only maine but you know several other states being our first payload launch so so the money that four million is to, to build our flight version of our motor because the motor we've been testing and we're going to continue to test probably through june is a really heavy duty version it's not a flight version um and build out the the launch vehicle itself the rocket uh so we have to secure licensing with the faa it's an expensive process not because the faa charges you anything but the whole process is very expensive you have to engage with contractors which is very expensive uh, and launch all the way to space so we will have one one flight almost surely that's a low altitude flight, probably up like seven or eight miles or so cool. just to test everything out to make sure, you know, this yeah. does what we think we do before we punch it all away. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, to be fair, like even SpaceX, their launch wasn't much higher than that. The first one and Astra, Astra space also the same thing. A lot of the rocket companies unintentionally go up just a mile or two. Um, so we're going to do a test flight uh, up and then, once we have received licensing permission from FAA, and that's that's really going to be a tough nugget, um, then we will punch it all the way to space. Cool. So the FAA permission and license isn't just about the rocket. In our case, um, which is pretty daggone unique to our company, is that we're getting licensing to launch for our own private launch spaceport, basically. Um, huh. And in, in Maine, there's a sort of confusion because there's this completely separate effort to develop like a public private spaceport. Meanwhile, Blue Shift is we are going to be launching off of what's called a lift boat, so a, a marine craft. I saw this. Yeah. Yeah. About two miles off off the ocean. 
so significantly far away from uh, wildlife and sensitive habitats and sensitive people for that matter. Yeah. Um, and um, once we have that, we will be the only company in the United States of America who will have access to the absolutely most desired direct, like your own personal, like on ramp to the number one orbit for those tiny satellites I was talking about. Yeah. So the number one orbit is this what's called this polar orbit where you put things going from north to source to south pole. So we will launch right over the Atlantic Ocean so we don't go over people's houses and homes. And you can't do this from anywhere else in the eastern seaboard. Yeah. You can't do it without going over people's, you know, expensive homes and property. And the only place you can do it is from a military base out on the west coast, which costs as much as it costs for us to build our ultimate launch vehicle. Yeah, because you so gotta we're gonna get out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's no, they actually charge us. They actually charge you as a rocket company three quarters of a million dollars or something like that for, uh, is what I've heard. Um, just to have the permission to launch from there. Uh, oh. Yeah. And they can be scrubbed at any mo- a moment's notice because of a military launch. So, oh, um, our government. So it's, yeah, it's an incredible, it's an incredible opportunity for, um, for us because uh, we're really becoming a vertically integrated, very small launch company um, that will, we'll own our own we'll own our own garage is what it will come down our yeah. own garage our yeah. own highway to the the number one orbit desired by these tiny satellites so Sam, yeah i was gonna say i'm getting the sense from talking to you too like i feel like when you're around anybody or any people building something it's like let's get as big as we can the goal is to get as big as we can to get the visibility notoriety whatever but it kind of sounds like hearing from you like you know your lane you're confident in your ability and your team's ability to build these things. And you're going to stay there and do that really well, which is awesome. Cause why do a bunch of things in a mediocre fashion when you can like really hone in? So I think that's cool. I didn't ever thought of it that way. Cause the goal is always like bigger, better, but this will be better because you're going to be experts of this thing. And like you said, you've got your own little garage now. That makes yeah, sense I, to me. Yeah. It's finding your, it's exactly right. You have to find your niche. Mm-hmm. Don't go where the big boys are. You're, you're no. doomed to fail. If you go to the big boys. And you see that not only like in this in our in our space industry in the new space industry you see see companies trying to go head to head with the SpaceXs of the world. Um, it seems really unfortunate, and you see investments and in hundreds of million dollars put into these companies, and you, they're just going directly head to head with these larger competitors that exist already. Can't work. And yeah, and so what I see is the opportunity is like you know as a as a as a as a as an entrepreneur and as a small business owner for you know over two decades, it's about how do you get revenue quickly, generate revenue quickly so you can yep. run on your own wheels as fast and as build possible. more. Yeah, and build on top of that. That is the most organic way of creating a sustainable. I don't mean sustainable from the business standpoint. Company. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you see too much where like it's like putting, it's like putting a baby on steroids. Yeah. It can grow really bad. Dude. Yeah, yeah. For what bad. purpose? And it's for dead. what purpose? Yeah, yeah exactly. To die at age seven. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I have seen that. I have seen that from when I worked in the telecom industry, manufacturing industry, where companies we bought out or invested in by a larger company, and bam, they are they. It's like a flash in the pan. <laughs> yeah. Too much fuel is put on that fire. It's put out. Gone. So, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Find That's your niche and win it. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Do you see any potential partnerships with other like up and coming rocket companies that want to use your highway um, potentially, or is that something you you've ex- not explored? No pun. Yeah. So uh, you know, I I, I but I've been asked that question before um, because having like our own exclusive, you know, spaceport, right? Um, yeah, is, is quite a differentiator. So one, I would say competitively, we don't much want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. It's, it's like having our own personal Lamborghini. Like, do you want to lend to the guys that own, you know, have come hang out in the garage? Yeah. 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 Don't touch anything. Let yeah, Greg drive it once. Yeah. Up. Yeah. yeah <laughs> let's get Greg in there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you can look through the window. Um, but <laughs> the other part is that um, a very key part of what we're doing, and this is sort of the keystone, goes back to our fuel. We mm-hmm. would not be able to get the permission of folks from the coast of Maine if we were not doing this in a way that was non toxic. Got it. We we had so many questions in the town hall meetings that we've had, um, and so many concerns about the toxicity of, of the rocket launches and the the loudness and the size. And we had to assure people this isn't SpaceX, this isn't the Boca Chica, this isn't the stuff you see in the news. These right. are small rockets. They're the if the rocket ditches in the ocean, there is no oil slick. Yeah. Yeah. 
It doesn't kill anything. If it kills somebody, it's because it literally knocked it on the head. Yeah. Or yeah. Some tail that's an act of God at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> some real bad luck for that yeah. uh, that Almost mallard or guy. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I I think and then with the FAA, we actually have to get permissions to part of that whole long process is to be allowed to use the fuel that we use. So if somebody else was to launch with us, they'd have to go through the same long permission. Yeah. yeah. You're the you're going to become well not not become but you now have you own the real estate just like that company on the west coast that's charging somebody three quarters of a million dollars just to use it not that that's what you'll do but you know it's your world now you get to dictate the terms and and set those boundaries. Yep, it's like owning the highway and the transportation company that rides on top of it. That's smart. That's awesome. That's awesome. So usually we go in a different direction with this. Usually we talk about like what's your favorite gas station snack, but. I did see a quote from you that said, you know, uh, you want to be able to, one of the great parts about doing this in Maine is you can launch a rocket and then and the and you can go get a lobster roll. So um, <laughs> your, your favorite spot uh, to get a lobster roll, you don't have, you won't offend anyone and you don't mention um, in Maine, where's, where's the spot for your go-to lobster roll? Oh, I'm going to offend absolutely everybody. with one <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. No, you won't like it. Um, I don't eat lobster. Um, oh. so, <laughs> I swear, I'm saving it for everybody else and uh, the tourists. I swear. Um, but you know, that's that that. But that is, I think that's that's the other part of the whole experience. And we 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 not only want to, you know, we have this sort of technical way we want to like differentiate ourselves and the market we go after. But we really want to create a launch experience for our customers. And we've learned a lot of, from interviewing a lot of customers. We've learned. Some of the biggest complaints is a lot of these places where they have to go launch from are dusty old deserts yeah. and they really yeah. dislike it. And it's really uncomfortable. It's like, well, Maine inherently is a beautiful, wonderful place yeah. that knows how to welcome people from all around the world, including for a lobster roll. Yeah. Uh, and we are going to make that as part of our, so ultimately what we want to create is an actual launch experience, like a white, like we are literally helping our customers off the plane. Maybe it's in Bar Harbor, maybe it's Bangor, maybe it's all the way down in Portland. And escorting them all the way to um, our launch area and making the end-to-end -end experience. So it's it's almost like you're taking a cruise, and yeah. know, maybe the peak of it is uh, you know it's incredible. What should not be fireworks, but a launch, yeah, uh, the yeah. space <laughs> in the middle of it all. So, so that's you know I I think Maine we have a lot of things that just has to be creatively sewed together for something that's completely different than you see anywhere else in the world. And I super think it's thoughtful really though it's super thoughtful right like you like you said arizona new mexico tech like wherever i guess florida is a little bit different but yeah. they're not great places to be and you got you guys live stream all of these launches yes all we we live stream our one launch which is yeah. we've had one launch and we live stream all of our engine tests okay. good, bad or ugly cool we've had all the above yeah. cool we're gonna be watching i know i remember when like i said earlier i remember greg sent me the link for the first launch or watching that and being like this is really cool so that's fun to be able to follow along with you guys What's really cool is that Greg can hear it uh, about uh, 30 seconds to 60 seconds before you can hear it on YouTube. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I remember we were on a team call and Greg was on. He's like, I'm hearing this. And he's watching the background. <laughs> um, so, Sasha, where can our tens of listeners uh, find <laughs> Blue Shift Aerospace? <laughs> where, can, where can they learn a little bit more um, about you sure. guys, whether it's through social media or uh, the website as well? Yeah, just you can go to blueshiftaerospace.com and blue does not have an E. So it's yes. B L U S H I F T aerospace.com. And you, you know, you can check us out over on uh, most of the social media channels. YouTube is probably the more interesting one just because you can see some of the kind of the wacky stuff we've done and some of the cool stuff. You can actually, if you have an Oculus uh, Quest, you know, VR yep. goggles, yep. we actually have a YouTube video there where you can, you can watch it with your goggles and look all around the side of our test cell. Oh, that's And it cool. is crazy. And the camera actually literally starts bending out of the way because of the engine thrust. And you feel it when you're in there. It is, uh, I don't know how many times I played that video. It's pretty awesome. I remember I saw it. This is semi-related, but not related, but it got me thinking about it. Somebody was using VR to simulate what it would be like to sit courtside in an NBA game. Oh, whoa. And I remember it because there's a lot of this flowing around, right? Right. There's good VR. There's something that's kind of like, yeah, that's not. There's augmented reality. This was the first time I saw something and I was like, I feel I actually feel like I'm kind of like when you go to Disney World, you ride one of those 3D rides where you move yeah. around, but you don't move, but it feels very real. It tricks your yeah. brain. Yeah. 
so that's cool i like that a lot that's really fun people would love to do that i would do that it's insane yeah highly recommend it well sasha before you guys um launch uh starless road um let us know we'd, we'd love to get an update see how everything's going and uh and everyone tune in um follow blue shift aerospace uh find them on everything social media sasha thank you uh yes. this is incredible uh you, we we really appreciate it and and um always welcome back you're gonna be our space expert um yep, for- <laughs> yep. you're our guy <laughs> thanks great. for coming man this is awesome yeah I learned a good lot. to chat with you guys thanks for yeah. allowing me to share the story for sure thank you. all right have a good night see ya <laughs>